so it's coming back. Reentry is awesome. It's pretty cool. <coughs> on my first flight, um, I was down on the mid deck of the space shuttle Atlantis. So I didn't have any windows around me. I only felt what was going on and as I was landing there. Um, as you know, you know, I mentioned already the spacecraft goes through some amazing temperature changes as they're coming through the atmosphere. A lot of heating. You know, the space shuttle's bottom belly was is all filled with tiles, thermal protective tiles. So actually when it's coming in into the atmosphere, it is flying belly first. It doesn't fly normally like an airplane. It flies belly first to absorb all of that heating. And to stay on track, it does a couple curves. So it's going back and forth like this. And this is how it's slowing down, coming through the atmosphere after its initial, what we call the orbit curve, initial slowdown. Uh, so I'm sitting there on the big deck and I'm feeling the space track and it feels pretty smooth but it's a little bit bumpy and then I think we were coming around the turn and the whole space track adventure went to go, oh my god, what's going on? And the guy next to me has actually flown in Atlantis before and he said, don't worry, it's just Atlantis because she's, she's a little weird to get around the corner so she'll be okay. So that was my one feeling and then um, when you land on a space shuttle, it's just wonderful. You land of runway, of course, we landed out in uh, California at Edwards Air Force Base, but you can also land at Kennedy, that's where we want to land. But it's dependent upon weather. If the weather is not good at about 2,000 meters, 500, 5,000 feet, uh, then you can't land because the landing is actual visual. You know, the pilot has to take control and fly the, the, the glider. It's only a glider. It has no ability to turn around and do it again. And he has to fly the glider. So if the weather is bad, uh, that's why we go to a different place. So we landed on a dry lake bed out in California, um, which was planned. This is our backup landing flight. And the, the pilot comes bringing it in, and then it's flying as an airplane. After it goes past the really extreme heating parts, it turns over and then flies like an airplane, like a glider. And so he brought it in, landed on the top two wheels, and the back two wheels. That was nice and smooth as it's rolling down the runway. But as you're losing energy, you can you probably feel it in an airplane too. All of a sudden, the nose comes down. But the nose comes down really hard. It's just sort of like smashing down. And we're sitting like right above the nose here. So it's like, oh, as you get to the nose here, it's smashed down. But then you just roll out, and it's very smooth. It's actually very nice. Uh, contrary to that, in the Soyuz, when we were coming in, uh, that's a whole different ride. Uh, it's a capsule that's just plummeting through the atmosphere. It has a little bit of directional control, and it's a little bit it is, uh, uh, built in stability. So it, does, it is stable as it's coming in, but it only has a, a little bit of control for what we call cross track, left and right. So it's coming in, and we, after we do our DR burn, we're sitting there waiting, and then all of a sudden I look over at Aki. I'm sitting here, Yuri's in the center, Aki's over here. And I look over at Aki, and he's like pink. He's got a pink glow around him. The people is actually going through all the plasma at this time. He's starting to pick up the plasma, which through the windows makes everything inside look really pink. And I'm like, oh, look at it. It's pink in here. And it's pretty incredible to see that. And then, and then it starts seeing like fireworks because uh, there's powdering on the windows that start to melt and, and go away as well as other things. You see sparks coming by the window statue. That's extremely impressive. Uh, the next thing, as you're coming in, um, as you slow down and up, is the parachute opens up. And that is like the biggest e-ticket ride because it pulls right out of the, uh, of the spacecraft. And you're inside, you're just getting bounce around like being at a rocky fucking bronco. But you can feel it start to level out or stabilize uh, out underneath the parachute. And that's nice, because then you know, well good, all that work, you, you, you know that there's a parachute above you. And then the last thing you do is you're sitting here waiting for the landing. And you saw that landing, and I'm joking around a little bit, it's not really that soft. It is like a 20G car crash. There's a couple ways that make it okay that you can sit there and be fine. Our seats are bolted to us. We actually, one of the parts of training, we go to a place called Spezda. They put us in a vat of concrete, and uh, the concrete sort of start to harden around you, pull you out, and then they mold the seat around you. 
so then everybody has their own form of energy. So that's one way. It also has shock absorbers on the feet. So right before landing, the shock absorbers extend. And so that when you land, you can bounce back on the shock absorber system. Or it's a Yeah. So good question. Um, you do get sometimes some pain, uh, particularly when you first get to space. Uh, if you can imagine, while we're here on Earth, uh, gravity is pushing your head down on your spine, right, and compressing your spine a little bit. When you get to space, there's no gravity, so this heavy head doesn't weigh anything, and so your spine actually starts to expand. All those little uh, cartilage areas between your vertebrae and your back start to expand. It's sort of like a sponge. And so, yeah, you get a back pain because your muscles in your back are getting stretched a little bit. You're like, oh, gosh, that hurts. Um, another interesting thing that happens is you have a fluid shift, which means a lot of fluid in your body goes up to your head. And that's why you see astronauts look like they have a big head and they don't have any wrinkles, which is really cool. Uh, so they look really good for a little while. Um, but what that causes is a little bit of stuffiness. There's so much fluid in your head, uh, sometimes a little bit of headache. And remember, we were looking at our eyes, and that's one of the things that uh, might, might have some vision problems because of intracranial pressure, this fluid going into your head. So there are a little bit of weird things that happen. But you know, you're up there for a little while, and your body seems to adapt. It gets used to that. It understands. And so some of those little common aches and pains go away, and so you're able to adapt. Uh, you know, we do have a whole slew of medicine up there, too, just in case somebody does get hurt or for a long period of time feels uncomfortable. We do have medicine. We are our own doctors, so we do take a little bit of schooling and uh, medical stuff before we go because we don't always have a doctor with us. So we need to know what to do. But we also have doctors that are sitting uh, in mission control so that we can ask them questions about what to do. But it is pretty amazing. Your body starts to adapt, just like those spiders, just like those fish. It's pretty cool. when You, you know, we're here on Earth, so our body is formed to live here on Earth. But if we were born someplace else, we would be formed to live someplace else. So you actually do adapt. So you actually do adapt. <laughs> what do you guys think? Are we going to get aliens out there? No. Oh, well, it's a big secret, so we can't die. No, I'm joking. Um, actually, you know, where we are is only 400 kilometers above the planet. So if we're pretty close, if you think about it, we're somewhere that's 400 kilometers from here. Something not too far, I think, anyway. It's about 400 kilometers from here. Or something like that. So it's not that far. Actually, you know, if, we're, if this was the planet, we're just orbiting pretty close by. And so, you know, it would take something that was almost going to land on the planet to come anywhere close to our space station. So from the space station, I had no, I didn't recognize anybody that said the aliens out there, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, I would have been happy to have someone to say, knock on the door, open it up, and have to come in. It would be very interesting. But in all seriousness, um, when you are outside and look outside at the stars on a clear night, you see probably thousands of stars, right? When you look outside from that cupola window where I, where I was taking pictures from, you see literally millions, millions of stars. There's no atmosphere to get in the way, so you can actually see stars, so many of them. And what's very interesting about that is you also see some stars that are sort of closer than others. We have the ability to see things in 3D with our, uh, our two eyes. It's hard to imitate that with the camera, unfortunately. But um, with our two eyes, you can actually see that some stars are closer and some are farther, which, you can, which tells you that there are different solar systems and uh, different galaxies that are out there, which is pretty fascinating. So, you know, with all those millions of stars, it's hard for me to imagine that there's not one other star out there that has a solar system like ours. It probably has planets like ours. Might have some type of chemical composition 
similar to ours that would have the ability to have some type of life form. So I think we would be a little actually upside down for about 20 years hanging in our straps before the rest of the horses came. I certainly believe that. You know, I mean, I think the International Space Station right now is some place that we're, we're going up there and we're living for six months. We're actually getting ready to go on the crew to go to live there for a year. Uh, so they're living here, right? Uh, if we're going to go to an asteroid or back or to Mars, if we're thinking about that, it seems very natural that just like the space station, the moon would be a natural uh, stepping stone to building a space station or getting to Mars, right? But you want to figure out how to do that first. So I absolutely believe that um, we'll probably be building something on the moon before too long and living in it and figuring out how we take the next step just by like doing the International Space Station. Thank you. So I want to come here to ask who wanted to ask questions of the other time. But I think you have given a very good view of the whole thing.